the National Eating Disorders Association's Parent, Family, and Friends webinar series. Today we are presenting Eating Disorders at and Beyond Midlife. My name is Ellen Domingos. I'm the Community Outreach Specialist here at NIDA, and I have with me Susie Roman, NIDA's Director of Programs. Hi, everybody. And we're so pleased to have with us today three wonderful presenters, and I'd, I'd take, I'll take a moment just to briefly introduce all of them. Dr. Margot Main, co-founder of the Main and Weinstein Specialty Group, is a clinical psychologist who has specialized in eating disorders and related issues for over 30 years. She's the author of Treatment of Eating Disorders, Bridging the Research Practice Gap, Effective Clinical Practice in the Treatment of Eating Disorders, The Heart of the Matter, the Body Myth, Adult Women and the Pressure to be Perfect, Father Hunger, Fathers, Daughters, and the Pursuit of Thinness, and Body Wars, Making Peace with Women's Bodies. And she's also the Senior Editor of Eating Disorders, the Journal of Treatment and Prevention. Dr. Main was a founding member and longtime board member and vice president of the Eating Disorders Coalition for Research, Policy, and Action a founding member and fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders, and a member of the Founders Council and past president of the National Eating Disorders Association. She is a member of the uh, psychiatric departments of the Institute of Living Hartford Hospital's Mental Health Network and at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, having previously directed their eating disorder program. Dr. Main is the 2007 recipient of Lori Irving Award for Excellence in Eating Disorders Awareness and Prevention, given by the National Eating Disorders Association. She lectures nationally and internationally on topics related to the treatment and prevention of eating disorders, female development, and women's health. Dr. Main devotes much time and energy to addressing federal policy related to eating disorders through her work for the National Eating Disorders Association and the Eating Disorders Coalition for research, policy, and action. Hi, Dr. Main. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. So happy to be here and to be able to talk about adult women. And next we have Dr. Karen Samuels. She is a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice, consultant to the Family Medicine Residency Program, and on the medical staff at Halifax Health Medical Center in Daytona Beach, Florida. Working in the field of eating disorders and body image for 30 years, she considers herself a community activist primarily. In 2001, she co-founded COPE, Community Outreach to Prevent Eating Disorders, a grassroots organization whose mission is to educate the local medical education and lay communities. With Amy Baker Dennis, she also co-founded EDNCF, Eating Disorders Network of Central Florida. She has written and presented nationally, raising awareness and bringing attention to treatment needs of adult women with disordered eating across the lifespan. Since the early 1990s, she has been an affiliate and presenter at the Jean Baker Miller Training Institute, Wesley Centers for Women, and with Margot Main, she also co-wrote a Stone Center working paper on midlife women with eating disorders. She also contributes to the JBMTIE Connections newsletter and delivers workshops informed by relational cultural theory, RC. Hi, Dr. Samuels. Thank you so much for being here as well. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. And just to echo um, Margo's words, it's just um, so important that we get to talk about this topic of adult women across the lifespan. So thank you for having us. And last, we have Denise Fulsick. She is in recovery after living with bulimia and anorexia for over two decades. She has shared her story through television, newspaper, blog, and magazine interviews, including an article in O Magazine. She is the owner of Metafly Books and the author of In Ed's Path, a story of recovering from a midlife disorder and No Body is Perfect, a children's book to children how all bodies may be different, but they are all beautiful. Today, Denise spends her days in a healthy balance of work, family, friends, and me time. She says through her through personal experience, I feel it is my purpose to share my story of overcoming life's obstacles and to spread the message of hope for recovery. Hi, Denise. Thanks so much for being here today and sharing your story of recovery and hope. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am honored to be a part of this uh, webinar um, and just to be able to sh um, share my story of hope. So thank you so much for having me. Okay. So now everyone should be looking at the control panel. 
Um, we have all of the attendees on mute right now just to control background no noise, but we really do encourage you to ask uh, any questions throughout the webinar. You can do that by clicking the hand icon to ask a question, um, or you can also type in questions or comments using the chat function. Um, so uh, we really would like to get to everyone's questions. If, if we do not have time to get to everyone, we will make sure that we forward any of your questions on to our presenters and we will provide you with the answers um, after the webinar. And I also just want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and we will archive uh, and post it on our website, nationaleatingdisorders.org, under the Media Center tab on the webinars page. Okay, so let's get started. We want to start with uh, Denise who's going to share uh, a little bit about her story um, and, and uh, tell us more about uh, her experience. All right, thank you again. Um, my name is Denise Solchek. I am currently 53 years old. Um, I have four beautiful children, six grandchildren, um, a very supportive second husband. Um, not that I have two of them, but I was, re I was married twice. Um, and I actually, um, my eating disorder began when I was 28 years old. Um, prior to that, I had some issues with um, some body image, but nothing that really um, was controlling my life. Um, but at age 28, um, I had had my four children, and I looked in the mirror one day and thought, you know what, I would like to get back to my pre-baby weight. And so um, I tried several different diets that were on the market, um, not really getting the results that I was looking for. Um, and all of a sudden one day, um, a thought occurred in my head about a friend of mine who told me about her sister um, who was bulimic and how she, you know, would eat and then she would um, get sick and for some unknown reason that thought kind of buried itself in me and I started using binging and purging as a way to lose weight. Um, and what happened was after doing this for a while and getting the results at the time that I was looking for, um, it not only became a way that I was um, controlling my weight, but it was also became a way that I was starting to control a lot of the events that were happening in my life. Um, for instance, um, I would come home after having a bad day of work, and you know my emotions were high, and so I would go straight to food and start eating, and then I would feel guilty about the amount of calories that I had consumed, and so I would get sick. Um, I would exercise different ways of getting rid of the calories that I took in. But what also was happening when I was, um, when this was occurring was I was getting rid of the food, but I was also getting rid of those emotions that were built up inside of me. So my eating disorder had taken on a whole nother um, part of my life. It was actually, you know, soothing a lot of the things that were going on. Um, so what happened was after um, 16 years of using this as a way to control my life, um, I started suffering from empty nest syndrome when my youngest daughter, who was basically my Siamese twin, decided to kind of spread her wings and go out um, and make some decisions that I wasn't particularly happy about. Um, and I started to, I went into a real deep depression and um, where I lost my appetite, where this is when anorexia um, joined in. And what happened was I lost a lot of weight very quickly and also a lot of my health diminished. Um, so my daughter and I were driving one day to Madison to go shopping and I lost um, consciousness behind the wheel. Um, there was no other traffic on the road, thank goodness. Um, so an accident didn't occur, but I did end up in the eating, uh, in the ER where my the oldest daughter was a, a nurse. Um, it was there that I admitted I had an eating disorder and started my outpatient therapy. Um, I had outpatient therapy until the point where my therapist said she could not help me any longer, and she um, referred me to a, an inpatient program. I was in the inpatient for five days and then um, put into their partial patient um, program for about seven weeks. Um, I actually repeated that same treatment um, two more times when um, I just was not quite ready to 
recover or to give up this eating disorder. Um, when my family on a Saturday staged an intervention and um, I agreed to go into a residential treatment program, I was there for 10 weeks, um, which was the big turning point in my life. Um, I was able to take myself out of my life and discover who I was and deal with a lot of things. Um, I did, um, I was released from there after 84 days of no eating disorder behaviors, went back to my house where my marriage was the one thing I did not deal with. And I was binging and purging just a couple days after I got home. I did have one more treatment at um, the first treatment center. Um, but it was actually making some really big changes in my life. Um, I did um, leave my husband. I moved to a different town and got a new job. Um, fell on my face, um, but then eventually realized I had had enough of this and started using all the tools that I learned in treatment, and that's when my recovery began. Um, I've been in recovery for six years. Um, I am doing amazing. My life is wonderful. Um, and I just love to talk to people and let them know that there is hope in recovering from an eating disorder even after a lot of years. Great. Thank you so much, Denise. And I know we're going to be weaving in um, some questions throughout the presentation about your story as it's relating to what Dr. Main and Dr. Samuels will be discussing. So thank you for giving that overview. And at this point, I'm just going to turn over the control of the slides to Dr. Main here. Okay, great. Dr. Main, you should now be able to control the slides there. Great. Thank you so much. And first of all, thank Denise for telling her story. Um, her story is the story of this webinar, uh, how women can develop eating disorders at all different life stages, uh, that it is not just a teenager's disease, and that eating disorders are not just about food and about the symptoms. They're really about how to deal with other very powerful emotions, stressful transitions in your life when you have no other ways to approach these. So really, Denise's story tells the whole story. <laughs> but we are going to go through some, uh, you know, some background material, and then we're going to talk about a therapeutic approach to eating disorders. And we're hoping that Denise will comment um, on lots of these things as we go along. Um, one of the things that uh, is crystal clear when we talk about midlife women with eating disorders is that uh, this has been an unrecognized problem. And so we're grateful that Nita is helping us to get this out of the closet. Uh, midlife women have some unique clinical characteristics. Some of them have had an eating disorder for a long time. Some of them have had it come and go a few times. So there's the issue of chronicity. There's the issue of comorbidity. Sometimes um, they also have other issues, uh, perhaps depression, perhaps anxiety, perhaps, perhaps substance abuse, um, and, and other things as well. Or they might have some comorbid medical issues. So there's a lot of um, complexity to an adult eating disorder. There's also the aging body, which we'll talk about as we go along, and a lot of obstacles to getting care. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit. Uh, you can see from Denise's story that it was really hard for her to do what she ultimately needed to do, which was to pick up herself out of her real life and then move um, into a residential treatment program for a period of time. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. Uh, let's see. My cursor didn't work. Um, I'm not getting the arrow. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, I, I got it, and it clicked several times because I had clicked a few times. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, we're starting off with this uh, material from Dr. Tom Insel, who happens to be the um, medical director of the National Institute of Mental Health, but who recently spoke at a NIDA conference in the fall. Uh, and he talked about the importance of the relationship in the treatment of eating disorders. Uh, you can see the quote right here. Some healing relationship makes the difference. The tincture of time also makes a difference. Connection to another human being is the essential ingredient to healing and recovery. You know, we hear a lot of things about eating disorders, and we hear about genetics and so many other issues. but one of the things we do know that is 
uh, time is a really important factor, giving yourself enough time to recover, not thinking you're going to recover just in one treatment episode and giving up after that. Denise needed multiple treatment episodes to move her through, and she needed multiple relationships to help her get better. So, um, and we need better research and more um, scientific study. We still know very little about recovery and about the disease process. And Dr. Insel also talks about the need for humility because we still have so much more to learn. So we wanted to start with those thoughts. Um, the face of eating disorders has really changed since the time um, Karen and I were first in the field. And um, certainly there's a lot of people who still believe it's something that affects younger women, Caucasian, upwardly mobile, um, white girls um, from advanced, um, technologically advanced nations like ours. But that's no longer true, and it hasn't been true for quite some time, actually. <laughs> um, eating disorders now occur across age, uh, across gender, we're seeing more men, across race, ethnicity, class, culture, and, and place. Um, there is a meta-analysis of 98 different research studies that found no differences in the degree of body dissatisfaction between Caucasian, Hispanic, and Asian women in the US. And uh, another study about African American women who demonstrate an equal frequency of abnormal eating attitudes and behaviors. In the past, um, it's been thought that African American women might be somewhat immune, and they're not. And we have a couple of people who've written about that. You can see those um, citations right on the slide. Um, Gender is still the best predictor of risk. It's still much more likely to happen in women than in men, uh, especially anorexia and bulimia. When we talk about binge eating disorder, um, it's three times more common in women than men, but uh, anorexia and bulimia um, are 10 times more common in, um, in women than men. Uh, Dr. Mead, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Susie. It looks like yeah. suddenly we just had uh, the screen go blank. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah. I'm just going to pause uh, the screen for a second. Yeah, I, I had, about my apologies. I had tried to move this slide forward, and now it's blank. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. I'm sorry. Apologies to everybody watching, but it looks like it's uh, back up there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, what we're getting to is that age doesn't immunize women from body image preoccupation and weight problems, as you saw in Denise's story. We're now seeing um, research also that tells us that disordered eating and a fear of aging can go hand in hand. Um, some research on women aged 61 to 92 who were asked what bothered them most about their bodies, identified weight. Um, I would think there might be some other things going on in their bodies as they age, but weight was the key for them. Um, just waiting for the slide to move forward because I have pressed it. There we go. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, much of the research on adult women and body image concerns um, is, is population-based research, not necessarily research on women with eating disorders. And in a way, that can be helpful, because we then can get a picture of what regular women, not just women in treatment programs, experience about their bodies. So here's a random sample of 1,000 Austrian women who were all average in their BMI. Um, and you can see that uh, a certain number met the criteria for eating disorders, and another 4% were subclinical. 60% um, of those women reported body dissatisfaction. Um, a study in 2008 in the United States, again, a general population study. These women were 25 to 45. Uh, uh, reported disordered eating and body image satisfaction, 67% were trying to lose weight, although half of the dieters were at a normal weight already. And uh, some of those same researchers uh, partnered to do a study on women over 50, and we say 79% say that weight and shape affects their self-image, 41% weigh themselves daily, 36% spent at least half of the last five years dieting, 8% um, report purging. So very, very uh, prominent uh, disordered eating and body image issues in a normal sample of American women. And as I said before, um, these e eating disorders are now just about any place. They're now globalized. They're found in over 40 countries, including 
the developing nations. And Dr. Amin, um, if I could interrupt for just a second, we have a question that came in related to this slide. Um, for people who do seek treatment at older ages, um, what's the impact uh, when you're in treatment with people who are much younger than you? And also, this is a, a question posed for Denise in terms of what was that like, if that was your experience as well. So Dr. Amin, if you would speak a little bit to that um, from a clinical perspective. Yeah. Uh, it can sometimes be a problem for adult women to be um, in treatment programs with a lot of very young women. Uh, sometimes they just plain old feel uh, guilty that they should have, they should know better, um, that it's okay for younger women to have these problems, but they should know better by now. Um, and they also tend to do a lot of taking care of other people rather than feeling that they can be taken care of. So uh, there's a lot of guilt, a lot of, uh, a lot of focus on other people rather than on their own needs. And also adult women have different issues. Uh, as Denise said, by the time she developed her eating disorder, she had four kids. She had a lot of other things in her life that she had managed and were active concerns when she went into treatment. Um, so I, I'd be interested in hearing what she feels about having been around younger women often in treatment. You know, Margo, um, I agree totally with what you said. And um, there were definitely advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages were, you know, a lot of the um, basic, you know, problems with someone with an eating disorder are the same. You know, it's the body image, it's the low self-esteem. So you would have a lot in common. Um, so, I mean, I learned a lot from younger people. I also learned a lot about how younger people think in being a mom. You know, what was what was some of the things that I was doing that maybe weren't healthy for my children. Um, on the other hand, you know, like you said, we're at a different stage of our lives. So, you know, I would be, I was contemplating leaving my husband, um, but didn't want to because I didn't know how it would affect my children. And here was a young girl who was struggling with her eating because her parents were divorced. And here I'm going, oh, my God, is this what I'm going to be doing to my children if I go through with a divorce? So, you know, a lot of it was beneficial. I learned some really good things, but some of it was, you know, a little bit hard, too, because, I was seeing how what I was going through could affect, you know, my children, and even showing what kind of role model I was to my kids. Um, you know, I was never satisfied with how I looked and what I ate and what I weighed. So I oh, and I was very verbal about it, and I saw how this affected young people. So you know, some of it was good, some of it was, you know, a little bit harder. Great, that's a good assessment. I think. Well, let's move along. Uh, to the next slide. Um, this quote from Christiane Northrup, who's a holistic physician, the state of a woman's health is indeed completely tied up with the culture in which she lives and her position within it. I think that tells uh, the story of eating disorders. No matter whether a woman is young or old, the messages she gets from our culture um, really have a powerful uh, impact on her. And we know that many of those messages are unhealthy. Um, trying to move the slide forward, but that hasn't gone yet. Try again. There we go. Um, the global body image. Let's just start with that. Uh, the first runway models uh, back in the early 20th century all weighed 155 pounds. Now, even the plus size models don't weigh 155 pounds today. Uh, the first Miss America in 1922 weighed 140 pounds, and she was 5'7", which you know is actually a really, really good average weight um, for many people. Uh, it wouldn't be good for everybody. It depends on your body frame and muscularity and all kinds of things, genetic coding for weight. But that's an adequate weight for, for many people at the height of 5'7". Uh, and that's no longer the case. In, in the 1920s, right after um, the first Miss America, um, well, well, right after we won the right to vote, that's when Miss America contest was started. And there was a lot of um, slimming, and the flappers who were trying to look thinner bound their breasts with things like ace bandages. So there was a lot of body image uh, discontent that started around that time. Um, my cursor, I'm not always getting the arrow here. So, OK, there we go. Uh, so 
Uh, half a century later, when we looked into the late 1960s, we had Twiggy, um, 50 pounds leaner than those earlier uh, models, actually 60 pounds lighter. Uh, she was 91 pounds and 5'6". Today, the average American woman is 5'4 and 164 pounds, and the average fashion model is 5'10 and 107 with a BMI of 15.4. So we can see the tremendous disparity between the real woman today and what we are told should be our, our model, so to speak. And here's a little bit more about the global body image. Um, in women's magazines, there are 10 times more ads promoting weight loss than in men's magazines. Uh, the Miss America uh, BMI declined from 22 in the 1920s to less than 18.5 today. Many um, of the women who compete uh, in the Miss America contest certainly are exercising in huge number of hours per day and, um, and restricting in order to get that body. Uh, so in, in these years between uh, the 60s, the 1960s and now, one of the reasons I think um, eating disorders have kind of taken off is we've gotten some conflicting messages from two prominent forces in our culture. One prominent force is the diet industry. The diet industry today is responsible for 60 billion, billion with a B, dollars of, um, of spending each year in the United States. So that's a big industry. And um, the diet industry tells women to slim down, take up less room, shrink, control your appetite, be careful, and lose. But at the same time the diet industry was coming into its own um, in the late 60s and onward till now, feminism was also becoming a very prominent force. And we get very opposite messages. Assert yourself, throw your weight around, expand your influence, trust and satisfy your appetite be bold and gain. So you can see that we're caught between two very different sets of messages as, as contemporary women. Uh, although um, there is some research that tells us genetics are a piece of the contribution to eating disorders, there is a tremendous cultural piece as well. So we see eating disorders as biopsychosocial disorders, and the culture is a big part of that psychosocial experience. The um, Data from uh, what happened on the Fiji Islands in the three years after Western television was introduced shows very clearly to us that culture can really reshape uh, uh, people's feelings about their bodies and create eating disorders. Um, Dr. Ann Becker, who's a psychiatrist and a medical anthropologist in the Harvard system, happened to be able to research the women on Fiji um, during the three years after Western TV was introduced. They finally had electricity more available and um, had access to a limited number of um, American TV shows. And prior to uh, seeing these TV shows, none of the women there talked about dieting. There was no talk about fat. Uh, food was celebrated because it was valued. There were times they didn't have enough food, so when they did have food, it was really, really celebrated. And having a large, strong body is important in the subsistence culture uh, because it allows you to do things uh, to, to survive. But within three years, those attitudes had changed. 74% of the women felt too fat. 69% had already dieted to lose weight. 11% had used self-induced vomiting, and 29% appeared to be at risk for clinical eating disorders. Huge change in three years. Uh, and as I said before, um, we now see eating disorders in at least 40 um, countries worldwide. So what are the threads across the cultures that are affected by, um, by Western culture? One is the exposure to the war on obesity and all the misinformation of the diet industry. Another is the overpowering consumer culture that teaches women particularly um, what they want and they, what they need from a commercial standpoint, from a consumer standpoint, but not to know our true wants and needs emotionally. And the other thread is the constant exposure to strict and unrealistic media images of beauty. Um, waiting for the slide to move. Uh, we have a few slides here that I'm going to go over very quickly so that we can um, get into more of the clinical um, 
approach to eating disorders. Uh, these slides are about the cultural diversity issue. Uh, and we have emphasized the Western factors that lead to eating disorders, but we may sometimes um, neglect some of the non-Western influences uh, that might contribute to eating disorders as well. Um, this study talks about an island in the Caribbean where there was rapid cultural transition and the quick exposure to Western culture and uh, consumer culture and all the other influences. Um, despite a traditional cultural preference for larger bodied women, um, eating disorders did develop uh, in some of the women here. But the um, none of the uh, black women developed anorexia nervosa, ner nervosa. It was more in the mixed race and the white women. And that rate was commensurate with the rate in the United States and in the, the Netherlands. Uh, and the women who presented with anorexia, most of them had been abroad prior to developing the symptoms. So exposure to um, countries like the United States. Um, this research tells us about Korean Americans. Um, the disordered eating was higher in native Korean women and Korean immigrants than in the Korean American group. And that sort of went against what we would think intuitively. Um, in fact, the one, women who were most immersed in Western culture had the lowest incidence of eating disorders. But as the researchers looked more closely at what they were finding, they found that Korean gender roles emphasized the importance of a woman kind of marrying up, marrying into a prominent family, a wealthy family. And the appearance is very critical. And so that is stressed over other variables. So the emphasis on appearance uh, and weight being part of that uh, was uh, one of the factors that contributed to eating disorders. And the Thai culture has similar values. Um, this research uh, says something similar. In Japan, the tendency towards a, a collectivism, uh, an emphasis on the group values and the group needs versus the individual needs is, is a traditional value in a lot of Asian cultures, but particularly Japanese. Um, so the rate of eating disorders and disordered in, in eating in Japan has increased, and it seems to reflect the intersection of the unhealthy ideals that they are getting from um, Western culture and the pressure most women feel to meet the social expectations, the group expectations or values over their own individual needs. Interesting. Um, when we think about adult eating disorders, we see that they come in different shapes, sizes, and severities. Anorexia, bulimia, EDNOS, binge eating disorder, subclinical eating disorders, and orthorexia. Um, and I would say that most of the women we see are more in the EDNOS category. That is, they might have some of the symptoms of anorexia and maybe some of the symptoms of bulimia blended together. They, are not, they don't fall into the complete category of anorexia or bulimia per se. Um, and many of them are subclinical. Uh, they're, um, they might have been fully uh, anorexic or bulimic in the past and then subclinical now. And the term orthorexia refers to kind of overly correct eating, um, eating that starts off with a des desire to be healthier, to have their family be healthier, and then becomes um, obsessive. Some of the women we see in adulthood have struggled since they were young and never escaped. Others um, recovered and relapsed. Some. Um, like Denise talked about having some body image issues before she had her eating disorder, but nothing major. And then um, the challenges of adulthood just really knocked her over. Uh, in adult women, we also see um, a comorbidity with substance abuse. Women with eating disorders are five times more likely to abuse alcohol or drugs. Um, and um, women with alcohol and drug abuse are often are 11 times more likely to have an eating disorder. Somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the women with eating disorders have a history of trauma, and we see depression, anxiety, personality disorders also coexisting. So these adult eating disorders are complicated things. It isn't, of course, just about weight and food, but weight and food become the um, representative of a lot of it. Uh, common threads across uh, generations. One is the universal language of fat. Women have been taught to translate negative feelings uh, into 
um, fat. If you feel bad about something, rather than exploring that, you just kind of focus on your body and decide it's, it's the shape of your body or a body part that's fat. And that becomes the focus instead of the real problems. Uh, uncertainty of the validity of their feelings, a shared ambivalence about their power, their place, their role as women today. Sometimes conflicts between what's masculine and what's feminine. If I, if I um, succeed, am I going to alienate people? Am I going to be seen less as a woman? Certainly, the exposure to the war on obesity and the diet industry, the um, consumer culture that we talked about a few minutes ago, and the constant exposure to unrealistic media images. Dr. I mean, we have a quick yep. question before we move yep. on, which is. Um, to what extent do those uh, are those common threads across adults for male and male and females, or is it just for women that those are really applicable? Well, um, we have not, you know, researched men as much as we have researched women. Um, but I, I think from my experience and from the experience of colleagues who treat. Um, more men and, and study them a little bit more, uh, I think a lot of the dynamics are quite similar. Um, much Thanks. of the, uh, I'm sorry. I think that was just, that was the question. To what extent they're applicable? Um, and I think that someone else had asked about, um, in terms of you were just talking about some of the treatment issues. Um, are some of those issues in treatment similar for men as well? Uh, yes. And when we get to talking about the relational cultural model, um, which is an approach that Karen and I are particularly inclined to use with our adult patients, although it hasn't been researched extensively with men with eating disorders, um, actually Dr. Doug Bunnell and I have written a little bit about this, that it does also apply to men, that men have relational needs uh, and a lot of the same desires and emotions as women do. And so uh, an approach that really looks at the function of the symptoms, um, the reasons for the symptoms, rather than just being symptom-oriented, makes total sense. Great. Thank you. Yep. So we're going to just look at a couple of um, Photoshopping-type photos, uh, uh, just to remind ourselves of how unrealistic the images we receive are. And these are not just images that young people get. The couple of photos I have here are of adult women, adult role models. This is Katie Couric. And this, uh, photo was taken in 2006 to announce her um, being elevated to a um, sole anchor of an evening news program, which was a first for a woman. Katie Kirk was a very accomplished journalist when this happened. And um, you can see that the publicity shot that was taken, you can see what she really looks like. And then you can see a thinner version of that. CBS photoshopped her body down into um, a slimmer version, even though um, she had not been consulted about that. And she asked that they use the original photo because she said, there's more of me to love. But here's a woman at the peak of her career who worked very, very hard to get there. And they have to slim her down. I don't like that. Um, I know I'm not the only one. Here's another example of um, what happens to our bodies and how we change them in the media. This is Jamie Lee Curtis, a very uh, well-known actress, very talented actress, who uh, posed for More Magazine a few years ago in her um, boxer briefs and a sports bra to show what her body really looks like. Um, she realized that she was doing a lot of talking about self-esteem and body esteem, but she wasn't walking that talk. So here's what she really looks like. But here's what we think she looks like um, when we see her on um, on stage, in film, on a um, in print. And as she um, was worked on by 13 people over three hours, she got this look. So every time we as adults look at a picture um, in a magazine or um, when we compare ourselves to film stars or celebrities, we have to remind ourselves that you know, a lot of time and a lot of expertise goes into that body. That isn't a real body. And of course, there's so much Photoshopping that goes on today um, in addition to that. Um, and here's another example, I think, of uh, the pressures on women to 
uh, to be thin and attractive, and that is the way you're going to go, get ahead. Um, this is Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough, who are the co-hosts of Morning Joe, but you notice it says Morning Joe. It doesn't say Morning Mika or Morning Mika and Joe. Um, Mika, um, to be on that show, to be at that um, level, has to also um, be very thin, very attractive, very sexualized, very flirtatious, and I think this is a very um, good example of that. The standards for women for their success include a lot of attention to our bodies. Uh, differences between younger women and older women with eating disorders, um, we kind of touched on this a few minutes ago. The adult women that we see are tremendously ashamed and embarrassed. They feel like they have a teenager's problem and uh, that they don't deserve help. They should know better by then. Um, they have more experience speaking the language of fat. They're so used to t translating all of their feelings into that. Um, a lot of difficulty admitting the need for help. Many of the adult women I have treated, if not all, are really super competent women who always take care of everybody else. And the idea that they might need help just doesn't compute. Their motivation for treatment is different. Uh, Denise kind of touched on this. You know, she had um, four children. And um, when she thinks about her eating disorder and how it affected her kids now that she looks back, a lot of the women that we, uh, Karen and I, treat seem to come into treatment because they are concerned about how the eating disorder may affect their children. And they want to stop the cycle of eating disorders in their family. Uh, Adult patients often are also more aware of what they've lost um, relative to their eating disorder. They may realize the impact it has had on their relationships. One woman said to me uh, recently, eating disorders just ruin relationships. Uh, she can't really be real with people. Uh, and also, there's physical complications that come with a long-term eating disorder. But certainly, there's more obstacles to treatment for our adult patients due to their other responsibilities. Maybe they're a parent. Maybe they're a wife. Maybe they're an adult child taking care of relatives who are aging. Most of uh, women have jobs and lots of responsibilities in their communities, and it's hard for them to tear themselves away. In addition, you know, the concerns about appearance don't go away just when you get out of college. You don't graduate from body image issues when you graduate from college or graduate school. Um, in fact, a lot of women experience more anxiety about their appearance and their health as they age because of the cultural messages we get. And there's a lot of stress and loss that comes along with adult development. Remember what uh, Denise said earlier, that she was getting rid of food, but she was getting rid of a lot of difficult emotions. And then there's the loss of power and status as women age. You'll see a couple of slides here from the Dove campaign. Is she gray or is she gorgeous? We rarely see a woman with her natural hair color these days. Uh, is she withered or is she wonderful? We do not honor aging women in cultures like ours. And the women's movement has kind of gotten reduced to uh, moving body parts around through plastic surgery. The women's movement is not dead. I want to move my chin down and my breasts up. I want Botox, Botox with that. Um, that's a big uh, issue for women today, that we don't have to accept our bodies as they age. In fact, we're kind of pressured not to. Uh, triggers to adult eating disorders. Pregnancy and childbirth brings up so many issues for women. Our bodies change dramatically. Our lives change. Fertility and infertility issues. Women who go through fertility treatment often have incredible revolutions in their body because of the hormones they treat, they take for the treatment, etc. Um, the stressful decisions about child rearing or deciding not to have children, menopause, natural signs of aging, things like divorce and infidelity that change your social status and put you back into perhaps dating again. Um, a, children, a child's marriage, becoming a grandmother, empty nest, all these new life stages that Denise referenced earlier, facing your parents' demise and death and loss, the pressures women feel in the work environment, trying to balance work and family, competing with men and with younger women, and then how women sometimes feel when they retire and don't have quite as clear a role in our culture. Now, all those things I just described are 
um, certainly biopsychosocial phenomenon, the body issues that women go through as they age, uh, having children, the fertility and infertility issues, all of those things, they're biopsychosocial conditions. Um, and yet the medical model, which is really, really medical, not biopsychosocial, has been the prominent paradigm for approaching eating disorders um, because eating disorders are so lethal. Um, treatment often focuses more on the body than on the person, and the, the person is a puzzle to be solved rather than uh, a collaboration around her health. And um, it's more of a patient-centered approach rather than a team approach. Usually in eating disorder treatment, we have, we have many people coming together to help that woman through or man through their difficulties. And in the medical model, the BMI is the gold standard of health rather than a more multifactorial focus on the complexity of other factors. Um, just a couple more slides. Uh, the transition to menopause is a great example of the biopsychosocial nature of eating disorders. Uh, this study in Austria found that um, a higher prevalence of eating disorders and body image issues in perimenopausal women, women who were right around menopause, not um, pre, not post, but right in the middle of it. Um, and um, it, it, this study suggested that there was more, um, more distress just about body image, not necessarily related to weight gain, but body image was changing for these women. And some of them had had surgically, surgically induced menopause. Um, so we see the biological factors, hormonal changes, feeling that the body is out of control. But we also see psychosocial factors, the transition into a new stage of development with a whole set of different personal meanings. Uh, when a woman kind of exits her reproductive life, no longer um, is likely to have more children. That brings up a lot of issues. Many women that we see um, for adult eating disorders talk about how puberty and menopause were similar in terms of feeling out of control of so many things in their lives and um, changing how they feel about their sexuality and sexual functioning. So that's often a, a big focus in our treatment. We are going to move forward. This is the transition slide when um, Karen is going to take over. It's a very powerful quote from a hero of all of ours, Martin Luther King. So I'm going to hand it over to Karen. Thank you. Am I on? OK. Um, so can we go back a slide? I wanted to start with this. Um, you know that this is very important. And I'm going to be talking about relational cultural theory and giving um, a brief primer on RCT, which I will use as the acronym. Um, but really, in a, as Martin Luther King so eloquently says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. So I want to introduce RCT as a theoretical model that we're in bringing to you today as a framework upon which all the evidence-based treatment modalities apply. RCT, relational cultural theory, absolutely is not instead of treatment modalities like CBT or DBT or FBT or other treatments, but rather is a relational frame that, as Margot has been describing, is in contrast with the medical model, that we are looking at the person in relation. So RCT is also not limited to psychotherapy, but is a model or a template for all of us, both therapists and healthcare providers, caregivers, sufferers, supporters, activists. And so it's a model for recovery, for social justice, for spirituality, for all of our relational experiences. RCT evolved from the scholarly work and originally with Dr. Jean Baker Miller's publication Towards the New Psychology of Women that was published in the mid-70s and as we've just been listening to, you know, was a time of overwhelming change in um, both the women's movement and this industry that really made our bodies at the center focus. And uh, Jean Baker Miller, along with the other founding scholars, formed the Jean Baker Miller Training Institute, which was a part of the Stone Center at Wellesley College. It is now the Wellesley Centers for Women at Wellesley College. And for more information, you can find it at jbmti.org. 
the premise of RCT really begins with the challenge of the whole model, the whole concept of separate self, that separate self as an essential component for human growth, that patient-centered focus, rather than RCT offers that the foundation of human development is based on our need for connection and context, rather than individuation and separation that all growth, neurological, psychological, physical, relational growth, occurs through growth-fostering connections, not separate and apart from them. That this notion of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you have to heal yourself, just leaves so many people struggling in recovery, feeling very alone, and as we've said, isolated and ashamed. So RCT seeks to transform that transformation of both internal, intra, and interpersonal disconnections into connections and empowerment with individuals across all differences and for our culture. And that we know that human beings by nature, we desire, we long for, we are wired for connection. But as we've just heard, due to cultural and relational templates and um, the cultural perspective, that we develop strategies of disconnection for survival to maintain emotional safety. Um, my era just went away, did it? There we go. So hopefully we'll move on. <laughs> it seems to be, there we go. So when we, I'm going to now move and be going back and forth and introducing concepts of relational cultural theory, specifically as it applies to eating disorders, that we think of eating disorders as a strategy of disconnection, and that it is a coping strategy that results from the chronic isolation of an eating disorder. And the central relational paradox is a concept that evolved from this work that all of us as human beings in learning prosocial behaviors for the good of our relationships, we learn to hold back key parts of ourselves for the good of the other, that we become caregivers, attentive to and skillful at reading the needs of others, but holding back key parts of ourselves. But when we do this repeatedly, chronically, we hold so much of ourselves back that it leads to a sense of disconnection. And as Jean Baker Miller um, proposed the concept of chronic isolation or condemned isolation, when one feels actually shut out from those very relationships that you seek to tend to, to protect, to care for. And as so many people describe, they feel like they're shut out from their relationships. They're on the outside looking in. And those disconnections, when they go unhealed and unrepaired, lead to further separating the individual. And not only from engagement with themselves, their, own, their ability to read their body's needs, their body's feedbacks, but also those very important relationships. And as we see in adult women, their struggle with their eating disorder goes deeper and deeper underground, furthering that secrecy, the shame, the depression, the isolation. And I think one of the things I hear women say so often and you know, challenge them with, if they feel stupid, they feel foolish, that they still have what they even see, and I think the culture promotes, a young person's disorder when it is actually very real and very prominent and life-altering to them. So these eating disorder symptoms often begin as a form of self-protection when relationships have been challenged, some sort of disconnect, whether it's a failure, an empathic failure, hurts, disappointments, an inability to express or identify disconnections and a fear of further pain um, and seeking, as we all hear and have so often thought about and spoken about, seeking a sense of control. Um, but really, um, as Irene Stiver, one of the founding survive, um, scholars of the uh, relational cultural theory model, described it's a life-saving and mind-saving survival strategy in the face of relational challenges, and that these relational challenges may or may not have existed before the eating disorder, but they definitely exist after the illness. And I think Denise described it, and Margot certainly referred to it, that the relationship with this very secret, shameful world with the eating disorder relate, replaces and competes with relational possibilities, with healing, with repair in relationships. And what we believe strongly with, from an RCT perspective is that change, growth occurs through our relational connections, not separate and apart from them.
So let me just speak briefly about disconnects, and this comes from the work of Mary Tantillo and Jennifer Sampner and others that RCT looks at eating disorders, as I said, as a disease of disconnection. A disconnection from self, from one's own thoughts, needs, feelings, etc., from the body and being able to interpret and know what the body needs. So often people say, I don't know when asked about um, what they want or need. It disconnects them from others, disconnects their families from other families because the families often feel um, caught in the web or hostage to these confusing disconnects. And then in treatment, sometimes the, pam the families and the patient and the staff get bogged down. And I think we've all appreciated that well, that's why, um, especially with the chronicity, um, people involved with the caregiving feel um, disconnected from one another. So when we can name those disconnections and identify that as in part the impact, of the chronic nature of these diseases, we get begin to move forward. So we, from an RCT perspective, look at the meaning and function of the eating disorder in a less pathologizing medical model, but look at it as um, an aspect of the relationships. And we really, while many people are aware of this, we seek especially not to identify and make it patient-centered. She is not anorexic or bulimic, but she is struggling with the disease in the same way that a patient with cancer is, is, is struggling with cancer. So we seek to be non-judgmental and moving away from that fear, the condemned isolation, towards empathic possibility, because those empathic possibilities are what allow um, one to pursue connection, taking risks, reigniting hope movement and finding the way to have some self-empathy. Is it moving on? Cutting edge brain research is also supports the tenets of RCT. So it's fascinating because the neuroscience and RCT are really learning and speaking very similar language. Spec scans, spec scans show us that the same centers in the brain are activated, whether our pain is physical or social. So we know psychic, psychological pain is every bit as, pain, as painful and uncomfortable as physical. And spot or social pain overlap theory tells us that the distress of social exclusion feels exactly <clears throat> excuse me, the same as physical pain and sh share the same pathways in the anterior singular gyrus cingulate gyrus. And, you know, when I think about this and when I'm working with people, you know, I think historically for many of us who've worked for years in this area, when people say, I don't know how I feel, I just feel fat, and say it repeatedly, you know, in the old days I remember thinking and saying fat is not a feeling, but I think now these um, spot theory and spec scans tell us Yes, it is. It is a physical sensation they're reporting, and it is really a very accurate way of telling you how disconnected and uncomfortable they are. And that including that, it's not only social exclusion, but even the perception of social exclusion that activates the same regions of the brain and activates that sense of disconnection and isolation. So I think, you know, as we were hearing earlier, even in Denise's description, that, you know, no doubt with four children you were rarely alone, but often could feel alone, and that that perception um, is what um, leads and so often dominates, is it? Hopefully we're moving forward. Mirror neurons are brain cells that seem specialized in understanding our existential condition and our involvement with others. They show us we are biologically wired and evolutionarily designed and deeply interconnected with others. So mirror neuron activity, another aspect of understanding neuroscience, is completely involuntary. It is plastic. Our brains are forever changing and can acquire new properties. How I'd like to think of mirror neurons are the brain cells when we feel empathy, when we feel understanding, when we experience someone else and appreciate the effect they have on us and we have on them. So our brains are plastic. They are not elastic. Um, and they are ever-changing. The human brain is absolutely hardwired for relational connection. Our neurons fire as mirrors 
in response to the firing of another's neurons. And then um, has Amy Banks, who's also um, faculty at the Gene Baker Miller Training Institute, often talks so eloquently, neurons that fire together wire together. This is the basis of connection. And that what we also understand more is that isolation causes the brain to atrophy. Neurons, by their very nature, are social. They shun isolation and depend on our neighbors for survival if they aren't sending and receiving messages from other neurons on a constant basis. They literally shrink and die, in the words of Cozzolino. The same can be said of human beings. So I want to move on and talk about some significant and important aspects of treatment that we really think about shame as essentially a relational experience. And as so many women, especially as we've heard women in adult life and as they're aging, feel incredibly unworthy. And they've become so practiced at being caregivers. There's enormous shame about self-empathy, about even beginning to look at their own needs. So in treatment, therapists must really be careful and attentive to the subtle ways that shame remains an oppressive force confounding recovery. It's one of the most powerful determinants for all with eating disorders in getting help, as we said. And as I was mentioning earlier, shame increases with women at midlife because they feel like they should have already solved this problem years ago and are caught in something that feels chronic and they feel terrible shame about still struggling. And these chronic states of shame and isolation reduce the possibility of empathy. So again, as I described, um, Mary Sam um, Tantello and Jennifer Sampner are doing research in RCT with eating disorders in women, helping clients, in their words, through the vulnerable state that shame evokes requires making an empathic connection that helps them feel their fragility and helplessness is OK, that they can survive these feelings with another, and that they will not make the therapist or other caregivers, other providers in their lives turn away. I often refer to this quote by Kay Lang, uh, isolation is the glue that holds oppression in place, because we know that there are so many factors. I also have switched it a bit, and I also say isolation is the glue that holds depression and the eating disorder in, case, in place. So really breaking the isolation, seeking to move from isolation towards connection is the challenge and the heart of RCT in our recovery process. I also want to take a few moments to talk about mutuality, because this is another central healing factor in RCT. And we're really looking to help the individual experience mutuality in their connections. So that begins with both self-empathy and empathy for others and receiving empathy. It is that, in the words of Judith Jordan, the openness, the responsiveness to being affected and affecting others. And mutuality often gets very confused and questioned and criticized in RCT. It doesn't mean sameness. It doesn't mean equality. It doesn't mean equal, um, reciprocity. But it is a way of engaging, of relating, where people feel they are participating fully. As Jean Baker Miller often talks about, where mutuality is when you have that sense of aliveness in the room. And you can tell that both people are absolutely engaged. So in the research that is um, in the um, beginning stages with RCT, we're looking at perceived mutuality. And it seems to be a good measure, a good predictor of how people manage relational disconnections, how they're able to mutually engage in recognizing, identifying, and repairing when that something has happened. So not surprisingly, women with eating disorders, by self-report, show much lower mutuality in their experiences with their loved ones, with their friends and partners, than do women without eating disorders. So with perceived mutuality, what we're looking to help it create, evolve, um, invite is this bi-directional flow of thoughts and feelings. So feeling, sensing, as I said, that influence on others and allowing oneself to be influenced by others. 
So it involves the risk of emotional vulnerability, responsiveness to the experience of others, and takes in the wholeness, both the similarities and the differences of others. And as we've been talking about, the isolation of chronic eating disorders often robs people of that sense of really being able to receive the impact, that sense of participating in mutuality. And as I see often in my work with adult women in recovery and seeking recovery, learning how to have mutuality, mutual respect, compassion, understanding, and empathy is critical to their movement beyond their eating disorder to different ways of self-care and self-empathy. We also draw upon this concept of fluid expertise and that we honor that expertise is constantly shifting, that everyone in the room brings wisdom and experience to the exchange. And we depend upon that mutuality, that mutual understanding of these disorders to find new ways to, to move towards healing. That it involves two skills, both empowering the other so that they have an increased capacity to share and being empowered by the other, that willingness to step away from that expert role, to put down that hat of certainty and expert and be influenced by the other. We also reframe resilience, because the traditional separate self concept of resilience is that bouncing back to some previous time of individual competency. Where with relational resilience, we're inviting the capacity and courage to reestablish mutuality and trust in relationships, to move towards better connections and moving from self to self in relations. And I couldn't say it nearly as beautifully and eloquently as my Angela, so I'll let her speak it. I'm not sure if resilience is ever achieved alone. Experience allows us to learn from example. But if we have someone who loves us, I don't mean who indulges us, but who loves us enough to be on our side, then it's easier to grow resilience, to grow belief in self, to grow self-esteem. And it's self-esteem that allows a person to stand up. The other central part, and I, I have this on a poster in my office, and I offer it to people all the time, is that Jean Baker Miller coined the five good things of growth fostering relationships. When you're in a growth fostering relationship, when you're working with someone on healing connections and developing that sense of mutuality, there is an increased sense of zest. And I love that word of zest. It's an old-fashioned word. It's vitality, energy, aliveness. It's coming together to form a we, a, a collaborative we. That both everyone involved has a better understanding of themselves, increased knowledge, increased sense of worth, so moving, as we've talked about, from unworthiness and shame towards worthiness and validation, and an enhanced capacity to act not only on behalf of oneself but other, others, and so empowerment to move beyond that particular relationship to other situations, other relationships, other experiences. And that when we think about the chronic eating disorder, it's the opposite of these five good things. From you, move, you live in a state that so often of chronic disconnection from self and that lost energy, confusion, unworthiness, difficulty act and, and, and continued isolation. And that can move from minor injuries of feeling ignored or misunderstood to being excluded, and more persistent disconnections such as chronic dis invalidation, isolation, neglect, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, and d profound depression and um, states of isolation. The other thing that we try to address and I talk about quite often is the power over versus the power with model, the, mo the medical model being the power over with the authority and the patient is the identified problem versus relational cultural model. Um, we really seek to work in the power with that when facing conflicts, disconnections, threats, the medical model, someone is in that power over position. Where as women in this orientation, we want everyone to be heard and respected and invited to come into voice and seek that sense of power with um, to avoid 
premature disconnections, difficulty in um, resolutions. And that in therapy, the engagement with the therapist works to move from that power over to the power with. And so often people will ask me the answer to the questions and I'll say, we're going to discover that together. I'm not here to fix you, but we are on this journey together. And again, my angel couldn't say it more um, beautifully. I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Are we moving on? There we go. So in therapy with the RCT therapist, can we go back a slide? I don't think you. The therapist engages, we discuss, we name the disconnections and the connections. We explore and express how we're moved and learn from one another. And we're really moving towards mutual empowerment in fostering these relationships. That we allow, in therapeutic collaboration, mutuality allows us all to learn. And Judith Jordan talks about responsive presence. She also talks about anticipatory empathy as part of the relational alliance. So we're bringing that secret relationship with the eating disorder into the relationship in the therapy and bringing it um, out into the open so that it can be named and addressed when the disconnections occur across the, the individual's life, whether it be workplace issues, family issues, responsibilities. Because we know, and women, um, especially at midlife and beyond, often come in saying part of their increased motivation is they're tired of their eating disorder stealing the best of them away, that their sense of pleasure, of passion, of things that they want to do in their lives feel like they get squashed or um, censored by their eating disorder. So we're trying to invite these um, into the open and create healing connections and that we're trying to create new neuronal pathways so that the dopamine reward system can be activated in so doing. We're giving the patient information and offering her ways to guide her decisions about the changes. But we also want her to be a part of the team. I always say, it is your team. We're all part of this team together. So it's a collaborative effort and that it's a process of recovery. It's um, not perfection, but it's a process, and that, you know, educating about the biopsychosocial experience. And we model that our bodies, as the therapists, as other members of the team, caregivers, et cetera, are also in the room, in the relationship, and are very much influenced by the culture. And I can't say enough how often women feel a huge sense of relief when the power of naming these experiences is brought forth and they aren't feeling like they're just things that they have had to struggle with individually. I'm going to let Margo step back in for this, these next two slides. Thank you, Karen. Uh, these are my favorite slides because they are very powerful messages to adult women particularly about the importance of honoring our bodies and our body's wisdom. Uh, and when I share this information with patients, it's sometimes transformational. So our bodies, just like our minds are hard hardwired to connect with other people, our bodies are hardwired to respond to starvation. Before puberty, a girl's body only has about 12% body fat. But during puberty, her fat cells multiply to a about 17% of her body um, composition, and that's enough to start ovulation and menstruation. In order for a woman to have regular cycles, uh, generally she needs about 22% of her body to be composed of by fat in order to survive, uh, in order to function and ovulate, etc. And that 22% body fat is enough energy for an ovulating female to survive famine for nine months. That means that our bodies have the wisdom inherent in them that if we were going through a starvation experience, if our culture was perhaps threatened because of a starvation experience, we would have some women pregnant who would be able to get babies born because they had enough fat on their bodies to sustain the pregnancy. It's just a miracle <laughs> that um, mm. that 22% body fat is also um, the gestational period for a baby. 
Uh, women gain fat, fat first in our breasts, our buttocks, our hips, and our thighs. That's to protect our fertility and our reproductive organs. So again, if that's all built in to the wisdom of our bodies. And in a famine, only 10% of women will die, while 50% uh, of men will die. So again, it's just so important to honor that. As women go through menopause, um, the average gain is about 8 to 12 pounds because our metabolism slows down 15 to 20 percent. And those hormonal shifts um, that happen um, where we start to develop some fat around our middles, um, that's an increase in the size of the fat cells around our middle in order to produce estrogen to maintain bone density and decrease, decrease the risk for osteoporosis and other um, symptoms of menopause. So as our bodies change at, at menopause and our, our tummies get fuller, and they're not really our tummies, it's that whole area, uh, it's in order to offset the loss of estrogen as our ovaries shut down. And the last bullet here is that moderate weight gain at midlife is actually associated with longer life expectancy for women. So this whole thrust of making women at midlife be um, critical of their bodies and get on a diet and, and lose weight before they ever gain weight uh, is so misguided. There we go. As, as we have... Um continue to work with older women, we've come up with some questions that we pose to women that um, at midlife and across the lifespan. And the first one, what are the variables that have changed at midlife that promoted your motivation for recovery? Is something we touched on earlier. And I wanted to ask Denise, in light of what we've been talking about, is there anything in addition that you would like to add? I also want to mention a couple of things that women have told me they feel have been central, but I would really invite Denise you know, um, you know. First of all, one of the big motivations for me has is, is definitely been my children. Um, my first husband was an alcoholic, um, so my children grew up in a house with two parents that had some pretty major issues. I also have severe OCD, um, and so you know, they really had to deal with a lot of dysfunction. Um, so, as I started to learn about myself and begin my recovery, I really wanted the help for myself, I, and, you know, absolutely first, but, you know, for my children. I wanted them to have a healthy parent that they could turn to and get advice from, and, you know, that was one of the big things. I also had a friend who um, I was in treatment with who lost um, her daughter-in-law, unborn granddaughter, and her eight-year-old granddaughter in a car accident, and I was at the wake that evening. And I just said, Kat, you know, how are you doing? How are you doing with your eating disorder? And she said, you know what, Denise, I am so done with this eating disorder. She said, it has taken away so much time from the people I love, and now they're gone. And that thought really has resonated with me um, and really makes me think of all of the great relationship moments I have lost with people that I care about. And, you know, I really took on the attitude that it's never too late to change. You know, I am I was 43 when I went into treatment, and I just, it's never too late to change. Um, you know, you really know, I mean, I'm so much more knowledgeable than I was when I was younger that um, I just feel that it's, where I'm at is so wonderful. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I would like to also add, because I think it's important that we name that not only children and relationships are a motivating factor, that I, you know, I pose this question to virtually all adult women and men that I treat as they're coming in to um, work with, um, on recovery, and that people that are not parents, do not have children, often say that, you know, they look back, and of course, Nobody chooses to have an eating disorder, and certainly no one chooses to have an eating disorder continue over decades and decades of their lives, let alone something that goes so deeply underground that it becomes their very well-kept secret. And that, you know, what I think so often happens is, as we've been talking about, that the um, other parts of the individual have grown, and they're often very um, 
engaged, very passionate about other aspects of their lives, and people tell me they're tired of having to share their lives with the struggles of their eating disorder, and they really are coming into their own past midlife as they go through and beyond menopause and don't want to be held back anymore. So it's kind of those five good things and more. So let's move on to the next question. What occurs in your relationships that leads to the disconnect and the distance from others and what happens? And how does the eating disorder help you to disconnect from other people? What happens? And does the eating disorder ever help you connect with other people? And in what way and what happens? And I think, you know, this last question many people will describe when their eating disorder first started that they remember someone telling them something or seeing something or someone. So often their eating disorder may have started by some trigger of um, discovering they were do they could do this, but that it then is like that ball rolling downhill and gaining momentum. Is there anything that you would want to contribute or um, add in in looking at these questions, Denise, and thinking about the disconnections in your relationships when your eating disorder was active? Um. Yeah, you know, what occurs in the relationships that um, help you to disconnect? Um, mm -hmm. With me, um, a lot of my struggles were again with my marriage. Like I said, my husband was, you know, had a severe alcohol problem, and so I eventually lost my feelings for him. Um, and our interests started to change as our children grew up. And so what happened was, you know, I. We just the, our connection with our relationship we found was basically the common thread with our children. Um, we were pretty different people. Um, we weren't good communicators, um, and so I think a lot of that was what chose me to disconnect. You know, in my marriage relationship, um, and the eating disorder definitely helped me disconnect from other people. I mean, when your mind is so controlled by the thoughts of eating or, you know, losing weight or counting calories, you know, you don't have a lot of time for other relationships because it really does consume you all day, every day. Um, and you're really not emotionally there for people. So um, it really did, you know, help to disconnect. Um, and did I did it ever help me to connect with other people? You know, the only time I really remember my eating disorder helping me connect with other people was really when I was, you know, meeting people in treatment. Um, and those connections could be healthy or unhealthy. Some people I met in treatment were very good for me, depending on where they were in their recovery. Other people were real triggers for me. Um, so, yeah, that kind of sums it up. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to the next slide. I know our time is short. You know, this is a crucial question. What do you know now that you did not know or understand as a child or a teen when the eating disorder began? And I think, you know, this question comes up quite often that people know that their lives are much richer and full and there's so much more that they're missing. And I think as a young person in the early years of life, they're just developing. So the eating disorder can pretty much be their entire identity, where women, um, as they age and move across the lifespan, have been caregivers, have so many other identities in addition to their eating disorder, that it often becomes this um, the, as you just did not described so well, Denise, this force that's taking you out of and stealing you away from your life. Um, and I know that many women tell me when I ask them this question that they say they really want to connect with other women. They're so tired with eating disorders at midlife. They're so tired of feeling like they must be the only one. And as you've heard earlier, there is, you know, we are recognizing that this is very prevalent and that women have lived in isolation and felt so lonely with this that it um, is so important to be able to talk about it, whether it be in treatment or in conversations like this one or finding some other forums. I also um, wanted to mention I have been uh, leading groups for women in recovery with eating disorders at midlife and women in their 40s and 50s and older. And 
they so inspire and move me in how much they teach me about moving forward. And one of the things that is probably the most resounding theme, I think, is what Denise just described, which is they have to upset the apple cart of their lives. They can't continue to live the way that they did. And that seems to push them to that point of saying something's got to change and I'm, I'm ready to change and glad to join with others. So I, I like to share this because I think it's, um, it's been very effective. One of the tools that they do is, you know, we've been talking about technology here with the, with the um, webinar that they use text support that people will often text each other, these people that have gotten to become very supportive of one another. So when they need those moments of support, they do text support rather than text support to help them remember to stay on their meal plan, to be able to speak up when they fall into that isolation or withdrawal. So I, you know, we have a number of more slides that I think will be available, right, Ellen? Um, or Susie, that they, they will be available on the website? Absolutely. They'll be available in the recording. Um, and for all the attendees who are on today, I'll be sending out the PowerPoint uh, slide for their, um, for their use as well. Thank you. Thank you. So this last question, what have you found most helpful as an adult in moving to recovery and most helpful in recovery thus far in your life moving forward? Denise? Is there anything that, that you would like to add? Yep, definitely. Um, uh, I think one of the main things is, is that you really cannot live in your past. Um, I was one who was very stuck in my past, and it wasn't until I received treatment that I really opened up a lot of those issues and dealt with them and put them in a safe place. And the other thing is, you know, is that you really can't live in the future. There's nothing guaranteed in the future, and to worry about things and you know, fret over everything really is pretty pointless. Um, I'm one who really tries to live right where I'm at in the moment. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that you really have to learn to love yourself, you know, before you can really have any healthy relationships with other people. I was one who really had very low self-esteem. My father told me I was worthless when I was young. And so until I was about 45 years old and really discovered who I was and that I had talents and I had worth in this world um, and really grew to love who I was. And I'll tell you, in treatment, when they say, you know, when you find out who you are, when you discover who you are, it's a really scary thing because I'm like, God, what if I don't like myself and i got to live with me, you know? Yeah. But I'll be honest with you, I have grown to love myself immensely and because of that, um, my self-esteem has grown, my love for life my relationships, being open and honest with other people have just flourished. And so I really do believe you have to love who you are. And once you do, you really, oh, everything else kind of falls into place. You know, I'm one who, you know, my my size really doesn't matter anymore. Um, I am one who I weigh more than I have ever weighed in my life but I really feel that I have gotten rid of so much baggage that was holding me down that I really feel lighter than ever. Um, and so, and I just, again, want to just let everyone know out there that there is hope. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Can we advance to the last two slides that have quotations for the, sure, and can you, there are, um, in the, um, these are a number of guidelines. Here we go. Fairbairn, in 1952, long ago, suggested that the basic goal of existence to be a, is to be in relationship. The, to be, the need to be in relationship is not a choice. It is a genetic mandate that we are indeed all relational beings and growth happens in relationship. And the last slide, hope begins in the dark a stubborn place that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You watch, you wait, and work. You don't give up. So as Denise just said, there is hope, there is help, there is healing. And I know that, um, that we see it every day in our work, in our communities, in our activi activities, and in our therapy rooms. So I just want to encourage and invite and inspire that for others. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're just going to put up a resource slide here for everybody to
take a look at, um, and we'll just take one, one or two final questions before we have to wrap up. Uh, but while people are submitting those, I just wanted to let you guys know that National Eating Disorders Awareness Week is starting on Sunday, uh, the 23rd through March 1st. And we're really excited about all the different ways people can get involved and resources available. You can visit the Need Awareness Week website at needawareness.org to find out how you can get involved or to learn more about eating disorders. We also wanted to highlight that, you know, as this is part of our Parent, Family, and Friends Network, uh, we also have a magazine called Making Connections with many uh, wonderful stories from people who are uh, in recovery themselves or supporting people in recovery encourage you to check that out. And we have many other webinars in addition to this one, which are archived under the Media tab of the NEDA website. And of course, we'll have our annual NEDA conference coming up in October in San Antonio, Texas, which is Thinking Big, Uniting Families and Professionals in the Fight Against Eating Disorders. I encourage you all to uh, take a look at our agenda once we have that released. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for scholarships or volunteering or a family package if you'd like to spend with your loved ones. And of course, Gers Books, which has publications about eating disorders at bulimia.com if you'd like to uh, check out what they have available. For those who are looking for uh, help and resources, the NIDA helpline at 1-800-931-2237, which also has a click to chat option, offers information for treatment referrals or support group listings. We also have uh, for NIDA navigators opportunities uh, for you to request a navigator who's somebody who has personal experience either in self or in support of a loved one. And they're available to connect with you to provide guidance, encouragement, and support, and connection to the professional help that people are looking for. And then, of course, our toolkits, which offer comprehensive information about eating disorders. And those are free to download from the NIDA website. So I'm just going to ask uh, one last question here that's come in that I, I really wanted to make sure we got to cover today. And this is going to be a question for um, Dr. Main, Dr. Samuels, and Denise, um, which is, do you recommend telling your children about your struggles and your story? And what are the potential uh, impacts of doing so? And so clinically, if you guys could speak to whether you recommend people do that, and Denise, sort of what your experience has been having told your children um, and whether that's been positive, negative, or what the impacts were for your family. Well, this is Margot. Maybe I'll start. Um, I think that that's a very complicated question. And we can't give a general principle because everyone's situation is quite different. Um, you start off with the age of the child. You know, young children wouldn't really understand um, the complications of a conversation about eating disorders, they, they might be able to understand that mommy or daddy needs some help and they have to be taking care of themselves and need to be away from the family some. But to really talk about an eating disorder with a very young child would not be a good thing. What you have to do with kids is to um, answer the question that they have and not all the other questions. <laughs> um, so. Uh, if a child were to say, mommy, why don't you ever eat? Uh, and if the child was like six or seven years old, to launch into a long discussion about their eating disorder wouldn't be appropriate. But to say, well, sometimes you know, I don't feel well and I have a hard time eating, but I, I, I try to eat when I can, is better than to launch into a, a conversation that they won't be able to understand. Um, so with older kids, you can give more information. You really have to titrate it to the age of the kid and the needs of that child. If a, if a child is going through a lot of their own issues, uh, you might not want to overload them with all of the complexities of the story of your eating disorder. So it really depends on the individual set of circumstances. In general, we do want families to be able to talk about eating disorders and get them out of the closet. But how and when you do it is, is really individualized. Yes, I think I there's add to that. Yep. Oh, are you going ahead, Karen, or Denise? Go ahead, Denise. OK. You know, I agree totally. Age is going to make a, a definite difference. but. I'll be really open and honest. This is a whole other webinar. Um, but 
but, you know, my children knew about my eating disorder a long time before I knew they knew about my eating disorder. Um, my daughter, her youngest, was in sixth grade, and she actually did a report on eating disorders, hoping that it would be something that would open my eyes, because my older children used to have her sit in front of the bathroom door when I was getting sick, hoping that when I would open the door and see her, that it would also be something that would make me stop. They reached out to people who, you know, kind of told them they didn't, wouldn't help them. You know, so mine, we talked about it a lot more once it came out in the open because, again, I was trying to hide it from them. But once, and they were at, a, you know, an older age, and once we did talk about it, um, they were able to understand and they were able to um, ask questions. And, you know, we really, our, our relationship was always wonderful, but it totally opened up with them knowing what I was going through and really talking about it. Um, and in my book, actually, my children each wrote a little section about what it was like going through with a, a parent with an eating disorder. Um, but I think it is something that at the right age they definitely will understand and really appreciate you talking about. And that's what I had wanted to jump in and say is that I think depending on the age, obviously depending on the family dynamic, you know, if it is done in a clinically sensitive modality, it is such a relief because if it's modeled in that relational collaborative way, it takes the responsibility. The children often, um, depending on their age, are acutely aware of something going on and a relief knowing that there are other people involved and they don't have to carry the burden of responsibility on their shoulders, that they get to be a support, a loving member of the family again and not feel like they have to figure out how to fix it. It just, again, Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. And I know we're just at the end of our time today. Um, so I want to acknowledge we do have more questions that have come in. So we'll be following up with everybody after the webinar to get you answers to those. Um, and as we mentioned, the archive of this presentation will be on the uh, media tab of the NIDA website. So if you'd like to go back and listen to it, it'll be available. We hope that you'll join us all again for another uh, uh, episode of our webinar series, and I really want to thank all of our presenters for taking the time to be here today to share their expertise. Dr. Maine and Dr. Samuel, thank you so much for putting together this wonderful slide presentation and all of your expertise in this area. And Denise, thank you so much for being willing to share your own personal story and provide your insight to the audience. It's been so wonderful. We appreciate everything you're doing. And uh, thank you all for being here today and taking time out of your afternoon as well. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap up for the day, and uh, we'll look forward to having you on another webinar again soon. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes. Yes. <laughs>